He was the commander-in-chief of feudal Japan, a military dictator with the strength and cunning to crush all enemies. For seven centuries, he was the pinnacle of this warrior society. History Channel International looks at the Shogun, the Supreme Samurai. At the center of virtually every chapter of Japanese medieval history, there was war and conflict. And at the center of the conflict was the daimyo, the local warlord. It was he who chose the fights, and he who led armies of men who drenched Japan in centuries of blood. Japan was ruled by an emperor, and the warlord served the royal court. That is, until one day in the year 1192, when the nation paused and set off in a new direction. That was the day a warlord, Minamoto Yoritomo, declared himself shogun. While all Japan bowed their heads to the emperor, it was the shogun whose will ruled. The shogun was a military dictator of Japan. The word is actually a shortened version of the full title, Sei Ita Shogun, which literally means commander-in-chief for the suppression of barbarians. The barbarians being the enemies of the shogun. In the Middle Ages, Japan was a group of islands with no central government. Instead, Hundreds of local warlords carved their own small territories out of these misty hills and valleys. Warlords and their samurai fought among themselves year after year, decade after decade, for control of the scarce farmland. Eventually, two power blocks developed, the Taira in the west and the Minamoto in the east. Soon, as the years went by, these two families would come into conflict with each other and threaten the very existence of the imperial system they were rewarded for supporting. These two clans eventually met on the battlefield. It turned the countryside red with blood. One man, Minamoto Yoritomo, would emerge from this conflict to change the face of Japanese politics. Minamoto Yoritomo must have been a, a very charismatic individual. As a 13-year-old, he's exiled off to eastern Japan, and he is uh, pretty much under the watchful eye of Taida adherents. Well, the first individual that uh, tried to look after him was off in the, in the uh, capital serving uh, uh, in Kyoto. And in his absence, uh, Yoritomo became intimate with his daughter uh, and produced a child. Uh, and that guy was obviously terrified. Here is, an, here is a young captive that he's supposed to be taken care of, and uh, the man has made himself uh, very welcome in his own home. Yoritomo was the heir to a prominent warrior tradition and his revolution was to inspire the samurais of Japan to sense their true power. He simply said to his fellow warriors in the East, uh, come fight for me, join my army, and in return, I will do for you what the court has been doing for you in terms of, of, of guaranteeing your status. Uh, but I'm a warrior like you are. I'm a provincial resident like you are. I'm not one of them. And he obviously touched off, or hit a nerve here. Uh, the timing was very good. Yoritomo led his Minimoto clan in a struggle with their rivals of the 12th century, the Tyrants. His armies were soon caught up in the great battles that became known as the Genpei Wars. And it was during the great war between these two powerful clans that Minimoto Yoritomo saw his chance to dominate all Japan's warlords. The Genpei Wars came to a dramatic culmination in the Battle of Dan no Ura in 1185. Dan no Ura is almost unique in samurai history because it was a sea battle. It was fought in the narrow straits of Shimonoseki in western Japan. 
The ships were fighting platforms, flat topped with rowers on a lower deck. Archers fired away from the top deck. As the ships drew closer together, swordsmen engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Metal struck bone in a final struggle for domination. The battle raged on. The boats sought to maneuver in the rough tides of the narrow waterway. In a brilliant maneuver, the Minamoto generals commanded their archers to concentrate on the rowers and steerers of the Taira ships, leaving the enemy vessels spinning helplessly in the current. The Emperor of Japan, a child named Antoku, and his grandmother were passengers on one of their ships. On board the Taira ships, it soon became clear that defeat was imminent. Soon, Minamoto samurai would board their ships and put them all to the sword. Tomomori, head of the Tairas, made an announcement. Suicide was now the only answer. Then he tied himself to an anchor and threw himself into the sea. Meanwhile, the grandmother of the eight-year-old sovereign took the young emperor in her arms and walked slowly to the ship's edge. She prayed with the child to Buddha and their imperial ancestors in preparation for the final act. Then, with the words, in the depths of the ocean, we have a capital city, she jumped into the waves, taking the young prince with her. The remaining Tyra warriors followed her lead by committing seppuku, cutting themselves open with their own swords and throwing themselves into the sea. And it was said that because of the blood from the numerous slain warriors of the Tyra, mingled with the red dye from the Tyra flags, made the sea turn red in the area of Dan Nawura. And there's one other legend about Dan Nawura, that the little crabs that live on the beach have on their backs the face of the dead warriors, because the spirits of the dead Tyra samurai live in these little crabs and still haunt the coast to this day. Yoritomo then emerged from the Genpei War uh, as the officially recognized head of warrior society in, uh, in Japan, the official head of, mil of the military and police systems for the court. Yoritomo's government was called Bakufu, named after the tents that generals set up near the battlefield. The great skill that Minamoto Yoritomo possessed was the skill of political adroitness so that he could convert his military victories over the Taira into something more long-lasting. As a result, he set up a system of constables around the country whereby these local samurai governors acted on his behalf rather than having the centralized rule from the imperial palace and the imperial court. Minimoto's loyal samurai warriors spread his influence throughout the country to make the point that his Bakufu government was in control. He set up his government in Kamakura, far from the emperor's imperial palace in Kyoto. It was his way of putting distance between the shogun and the emperor, to remove himself from the emperor's influence and to make a statement that the shogunate was a government of the samurai and not of the court. With this Bakufu rule, Yoritomo managed to do more for Japan than the emperors before him had ever achieved. Besides bringing the warring daimyos under his control, he created the first warrior government the Japanese people had ever known. In the process, he brought order to Japan, establishing a justice system fairer than anything that preceded it. Warriors took over tasks that the former bureaucrats of the imperial palace had been doing badly or corruptly. His loyal constables monitored everything from taxation to agriculture to military recruitment. We generally see Yoritomo as the first important military figure uh, to sort of initiate a long period of samurai involvement, if not outright control, uh, of the political process in Japan. The first shogun ruled with an iron fist, but knew how to be even-handed. When Yoritomo died in 1199, the tradition of the super warlord
was established. But every shogun that followed knew what Yoritomo knew. The shogun would only survive if he was the wiliest fox in a forest of ambitious and dangerous warlords. We'll continue in a moment. A century and a half after the first shogun died, a new dynasty of military rulers rose to power, one which embodied the greatest strengths and the most profound weaknesses of the Bakufu government. The dynasty was called Ashikaga, and its members were descendants of the earliest shogun's Minamoto clan. The most glorious Ashikaga was Yoshimitsu. He was the first shogun to use war as a means toward peace. Yoshimitsu had learned well the lesson of the first shogun. What separated the shogun from the other warlords was his cunning mind. For Japan was still rife with territorial disputes. To put an end to these rivalries, indeed to survive, would take a master diplomat. In 1392, two rival clans pitted huge samurai armies against each other as each claimed one of its heirs, Emperor of all Japan. As a result, there was the Emperor of the North and an Emperor of the South. Yoshimitsu called the two rival clan leaders together for a meeting. Through negotiations that were full of ceremony and courtly manners, he played on their sense of pride and honor. Perhaps he suggested they could work out an arrangement in which each party got his wish. Both clans could have an emperor. Yoshimitsu brought the wars to an end, not so much by a military victory, but by negotiation, whereby the succession between the two lines would alternate. That satisfied the competing warlords and brought peace to Japan. Uh, Yoshimitsu is known to us historically far more as a patron of the arts uh, than he is as a military figure, even though it was during his particular uh, tenure as shogun uh, that the endemic warfare that had been going on in Japan for several decades uh, was brought to a halt as he brought the northern and the southern courts uh, together again. Uh, but really, we think of him as a, a patron of the arts, of a collector of fine uh, Chinese art goods and uh, library. Shogun Yoshimitsu, the negotiator and the peacemaker, brought Japan into a brief but significant era of peace. Under his rule, the arts flourished. Without the fear of conquest and battle, calligraphy, poetry, and music developed as they never had before. During Yoshimitsu's reign and during his lifetime, the shogun's court actually supplanted the imperial court as not only the political seat of political power in Japan, but also as the seat of cultural norms and, and, and uh, cultural ideals. During the peaceful rule of Yoshimitsu and his successors, the tea ceremony developed. As the tea ceremony celebrates the beauty and tranquility of everyday life, so Yoshimitsu's life was lived in peace, proving that a warlord, a shogun, the man with the ultimate power of life and death in Japan, could cultivate the arts as carefully as he had outmaneuvered his enemies. Yoshimitsu transformed the capital Kyoto into a magnificent city of temples and gardens. One of his most famous artistic accomplishments is the creation of, of what's called the Golden Pavilion, uh, a, a fairly elaborate and, and very expensive temple complex in, in the capital city. Here, Ashikaga Yoshimitsu, the arbiter of taste, held poetry parties, flower viewing parties, established and largely developed the tea ceremony, and entertained emperors, courtiers, and ambassadors from China. 
if the high point of Muromachi uh, warrior government came under Yoshimitsu, uh, his successors were not so fortunate. By the time we reached the 8th Shogun Yoshimasa, already... things had begun to unravel uh, rather severely, and Yoshimasa was not able to preside over a very powerful uh, warrior government at all. Five Ashikaga heirs succeeded Yoshimitsu as shogun, but their reigns were disappointing. The final Ashikaga shogun, and perhaps the most tragic, was his great-great-grandson, Yoshimasa. Yoshimitsu had built a pavilion of gold. Yoshimasa determined to build a pavilion of silver. The pavilion was built, but funds ran out before it could be coated in silver as he had planned. And this, in a sense, was symbolic of the age, because whereas the silver pavilion is unfinished, so was Yoshimasa's own attempts at government. Yoshimasa idolized his great-great-grandfather but lacked his diplomatic skills. The, uh, the position of the shogun at the head of warrior society deteriorated so badly that it was almost non-existent. Uh, and Yoshimasa himself didn't seem to have had a whole lot of interest in, in, uh, uh, in maintaining his governing authority. He was far more interested in, in, uh, uh, in being just a patron of the arts. He was something of a playboy. While the shogun concerned himself with poetry and flowers, rival clans schemed to seize power. Soon, all of Japan was caught up in a bloody civil war. Kyoto itself became a battleground. And we have skirmishes where one group goes out and burns out the buildings of one particular group. And then there are counterattacks, uh, and buildings of the other group are burned down. Uh, and again, the commoners' lives, the people who lived in the city of Kyoto, were affected in ways that they had never been in previous battles. The citizens of Kyoto began to evacuate the city. Invading armies confiscated their empty houses. Barricades appeared in the streets. Opposing samurai warriors dug trenches facing each other along the city's grand avenues. And within a short space of time, this beautiful city, which consisted of buildings built largely of wood, was reduced to blackened ashes. While Yoshimasa devoted his energies to a courtly life of tea ceremonies, flower viewing parties, and poetry readings, outside the palace walls, the ravages of the Onin War spread destruction throughout Japan. In fact, the war really never ended. Uh, instead, it sort of petered out in the capital and drifted off into the provinces. And uh, warriors established themselves as more or less autonomous uh, provincial barons uh, and fight one another on a fairly constant basis. It was time for a true warrior to help steer the nation back on the road to peace. Soon, one did. A man from humble beginnings who would inaugurate the greatest era of the long rule of the shoguns. We'll continue in a moment. By the 16th century, clans, bandits, and fanatic religious cults fought one another in struggles so relentless that the period became known as the Age of the Country at War. Provincial warlords had become their own masters once again the countryside spun off into many small kingdoms rather than one central government. One warlord would steer the country back on the road to peace. His name was Oda Nobunaga. He was an intrepid warrior, uh, absolutely without fear, uh, and absolutely, it would seem, without shame. Uh, we remember him today because of the tremendous cruelty that he seems to have exhibited uh, in dealing with his enemies. As the British historian George Sampson uh, once noted, he was a cruel and callous brute. Nobunaga's origins were humble.
too humble for him to ever dream of becoming a shogun. The son of a minor warlord, he remained a small territorial chieftain until opportunity knocked at his door. He controlled a comparatively small area of land. But it was very strategically situated because to the east of the Oda territories was the territory of the much more powerful family of Imagawa. And in 1560, Imagawa Yoshimoto, the head of the clan, conceived a grandiose plan of marching on Kyoto and setting himself up as shogun. With a sizable force of 25,000, the defiant warlord began to march towards Kyoto. Following the etiquette of the day, Yoshimoto planned to notify the various warlords whose territories he would pass through. There was one neighbor, though, who wouldn't be worth this consideration. Now, it so happened that the first territory that Imagawa would have to pass through was Oda Nobunaga's own province. And he clearly regarded Nobunaga as a minor irritation to be brushed to one side. After all, his troops outnumbered the Oda troops by 12 to 1. Imagawa's samurai burned three of Nobunaga's frontier fortresses with little real resistance. So confident was Imagawa Yoshimoto of ultimate victory that he rested his troops in a little gorge and held one of the traditional head-viewing ceremonies. By the time Yoshimoto had settled his troops down for a rest, Nobunaga was already mobilizing his men for an attack. During a heavy thunderstorm, Nobunaga's samurai overran the camp. The intruders reached for their weapons, and the killing began. When Yoshimoto awoke from his nap, he could hear noise and shouts, but he mistook it for a brawl among his men. Just as he emerged from his tent to stop the fighting, he saw a Nobunaga samurai racing towards him. It was the last thing he ever saw. The Battle of Okihazama, as it is called, lasted only for about 15 minutes, and it turned out to be one of the most decisive battles in Japanese history, because it raised Oda Nobunaga the minor warlord, to a position of military preeminence in central Japan. It was his springboard to move towards a goal of unification. At the age of only 21, Nobunaga was on his way to becoming the ruler of all Japan. He continued to wage campaigns across the country. One by one, he eliminated the country's most feared and unruly warlords. Province after province fell under Nobunaga's control. If we tend to think today of Oda Nobunaga as a, a warrior who was absolutely uh, ferocious in defeating his enemies and not giving an inch, uh, all of his life wasn't devoted totally to the military conquest uh, of Japan. He was a man of very eclectic interests. Uh, and certainly we owe a lot to uh, Oda Nobunaga as the individual who uh, perhaps facilitated the spread of uh, early uh, Western civilization in Japan. It was in the 1540s, uh, as a matter of fact, that uh, European civilization reached Japan. He made brilliant use of the newly arriving Europeans. He pitted the Christian missionaries against a fanatical Buddhist sect of warrior monks. They were tough fighters who had challenged his rule and caused him endless problems on the battlefield. He let loose newly converted Christian samurai with a religious fanaticism of their own. They took on the monks with tremendous courage and determination. Nobunaga swore that he would destroy them yama yama tani tani, which means on every mountain and in every valley. He destroyed them uh, without a moment's uh, thought. Thousands of people met their death. Uh, particularly, he is remembered, for example, for burning down the entire religious establishment at Mount Hiei, which had been the protective uh, temple for the capital at Kyoto uh, since it was f founded in the ninth century. Uh, and thousands of people met their death when he burned down uh, all those buildings and, and put everyone to the sword. 
Nobunaga was quick to employ another export to the shores of Japan. Gunpowder. He was the first warlord really to understand the potential of using guns in battle. Lots of other warlords used them, but very few had used them effectively. At the Battle of Nagashino, Nobunaga put his musketeers on the front line and ordered rotating volleys. As inaccurate as they were, the volleys proved deadly, cutting down the closely gathered enemy samurai as soon as they ventured too close. The soldiers would then charge and finish off the enemy. His power consolidated, Nobunaga ordered a magnificent castle built, overlooking the largest lake in Japan. He then commissioned the country's most famous painter to fill it with golden screens of great splendor. Nobunaga's authority remained unchallenged for over 20 years, until in 1582, an ambitious general decided to seize an opportunity. Nobunaga had stopped for the night at a temple in Kyoto on his way to a castle siege in the west. He never suspected that the traitorous general, Akechi Mitsuhide, was preparing to set the structure to the torch. While flames began to consume his placid surroundings, Nobunaga would deny his enemies the pleasure of assassinating him. He committed ritual suicide. The man who killed him, Akechi Mitsuhide, has acquired the title into history of the 13-day shogun, because 13 days is all that he lasted. Once the news of Nobunaga's assassination reached his loyal general Hideyoshi, Hideyoshi rushed back to Kyoto to destroy the usurper. The treacherous assassin's plans of ruling Japan were never to materialize. Nobunaga's trusted protege, Toyotomi Hideyoshi took his revenge. This next great shogun would use his tremendous military skill, fierceness, and cunning to further unify a war-torn country. We'll continue in a moment. Toyotomi Hideyoshi avenged the death of his master, Oda Nobunaga. He had the murderer's head put on public display. A crude form of press release, clearly a warning that Hideyoshi was taking over where Nobunaga had left off. But Hideyoshi found a Japan still torn apart by restless warlords. He quickly set out to further the cause of reunification. Toyotomi Hideyoshi was Japan's most dramatic rags to riches story. He began life as a peasant, as a foot soldier in Nobunaga's army. But his skill, his fierceness, and his cunning helped him advance as a military officer. He is an individual that showed incredible. Uh, ability to fight and to organize troops, to communicate well with other troops who were placed under him, and he rose rather rapidly within the command of uh, Oda Nobunaga. Hideyoshi had risen from the peasant class to become a commander of samurai. Eventually, he became the ruler of all Japan. He was a fearsome sight, a warrior who led his men into battle. Some people said he had the face of a wizened monkey but that on the field of battle he was a veritable war guard. Unlike the other two great unifiers of Japan, Hideyoshi led from the front. Hideyoshi was as crafty as he was ruthless, and he soon implemented a plan to rid the islands of undesirable weaponry and any challenges to his authority. In 1587, he issued... an 
edict that all non-samurai were to turn in their swords. The soldiers fanned out across Japan in what became known as the Great Sword Hunt. We decided that the peasantry, the population at large, did not need to be armed. Uh, as he said in his particular edict, it hindered the collection of taxes, as one could imagine uh, it very well did. Uh, and so an enormous amount of arms was collected from the population uh, at large. Uh, so that Hideyoshi could feel more secure. This meant that there were fewer people out there who could perhaps rise up uh, and smite him down. He knew that his enemies would be outraged. So his sword collectors simply explained that the weapons were to be melted down and transformed into a huge statue of Buddha. It would benefit it by bringing about peace and also it would be honored in the next life because these weapons of war would have been melted down and turned not quite from swords into plowshares but from swords into an image of their god. But even with the thousands of weapons smelted into the prodigious belly and smiling eyes of the great Buddha, Hideyoshi's work was not complete. One proud clan still refused to buckle under the shogun's rule. These were the mighty Hojo, who ruled the east of Japan from their fortress of Odawara. Toyotomi Hideyoshi laid siege to Odawara Castle with an army of nearly a quarter of a million men. The Hojo were hopelessly outnumbered, but tried to resist. Hideyoshi deployed his army on all sides of the fortress. Sizing up his enemy's defenses, he decided the best course was to starve the Hojo out. In a letter to his mother, written in 1590, Hideyoshi described his strategy and the importance of this battle. Please do not worry about me. Now that I have had Odawara tightly besieged, I control 80% of what goes on in the provinces. Since Odawara is the key to the entire nation, I have to starve them out. So it will take time. The siege wore on. Hideyoshi was patient. The samurai grew vegetables and played games while the shogun waited. Eventually, the Hojo realized they could hold out no longer and a deal was done. A couple of suicides here, a resignation there. Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the supreme shogun, had unified Japan in a way not known for centuries. The last obstacle to reunification had fallen. For the first time since the rule of Yoshimitsu in the 1300s, Japan bowed to the will of one man, Shogun Hideyoshi. One of the first uh, things Hideyoshi begins to do when he finds himself finally having achieved power is to shut the door behind him and make sure that no one else can ever again do what he just did. Hideyoshi, the peasant who became Shogun, decided that all samurai must now come from samurai families. No one could do what he had, rise from a lowly birth to the pinnacle of power. Uh, he begins uh, the idea of social separation of class, trying to define what is a samurai, what is a peasant, uh, what is a merchant, and who should live where. So we see a kind of structuring of uh, class society that had not existed for a long period in Japanese history. There had been a great deal of chaos, and people moved up and down the social order fairly, fairly easily. But after Hideyoshi, it became increasingly impossible to do that. Hideyoshi now turned his attention abroad. In 1592, he launched an invasion of Korea with a force of over 100,000 men. They made rapid progress, fighting their way up through the Korean peninsula to Seoul and beyond. However, sickness, the winter frost, together with constant guerrilla attacks, gradually undermined the Japanese military position. Hideyoshi's regime was weakened as a result of the failed Korean expedition. 
Hideyoshi, who had fought his way into the samurai class and made it rule supreme, now faced the same problems as his predecessor, Oda Nobunaga. If Oda Nobunaga was not able to pass on his control of Japan to his descendants, neither was Toyotomi Hideyoshi to be successful in founding a lasting power structure uh, in Japan. Uh, certainly he wasn't the first one to have this problem in Japan, but of course it all boiled down to having an appropriate heir to which he could pass his position on to. As Hideyoshi lay dying in 1598, he announced that his infant son, Hideyori, would succeed him. Uh, several times before he was to pass away, Toyotomi Hideyoshi called to him uh, his five major uh, generals. Uh, asking them and swearing that, and having them swear that they would in fact support Hideyori, Hideyori uh, upon Hideyoshi's death. The fact that he had to call them together more than once suggests that he was somewhat apprehensive as to the future of uh, his young son. And in fact, that's exactly what was to happen. One general in particular, Togugawa Ieyasu, a trusted confidant, pledged his loyalty. It was a promise he would not keep. Within hours of Hideyoshi's death, this warrior would begin his own bloody struggle to earn the title of Shogun. Almanac will continue in a moment. Tokugawa Ieyasu's rule was born in betrayal and anointed in blood. He had sworn at the deathbed of Shogun Hideyoshi, his mentor, that he would support his son as Shogun. Now, the third of the great unifiers of Japan claimed the title of Shogun for himself. There's a story about how Ieyasu, Hideyoshi, and Nobunaga were supposedly sitting out on a veranda one night watching a nightingale. Uh, sitting on the uh, in a tree nearby, and they begin discussing how it is that, that they would get this nightingale to sing. Uh, Nobunaga says, "Oh, well, that's simple. Uh, if it doesn't sing, I'd kill it." Uh, Hideyoshi says, "No, no, no, no. Wrong approach. What you do is you maneuver it into a position where it has to sing." Uh, Ieyasu says, no, "No, you've you've got this all wrong. It's very simple. You wait. Eventually, it will sing." Ieyasu who had sworn loyalty to Hideyoshi and waited patiently for the opportunity to betray him. On a misty morning in October 1600, he prepared to do battle with the forces still loyal to the late shogun's young son, Hideyori. They met in battle in 1600 at a little place called Sekigahara. Sekigahara was one of the most decisive battles in Japanese history. The morning of the battle was so foggy that the opposing armies literally bumped into one another. Slowly they assumed positions on opposite sides of the valley and waited for the clouds to lift. The sun finally burned through and the battle began. Ieyasu ordered a blast of firearms that sent his enemies tumbling down the far hill and followed up with a full-scale attack. The musket units abandoned their guns and resorted to more traditional fighting techniques, face-to-face, one-on-one. The Tokugawa triumphed. They destroyed their enemies utterly. At the conclusion of the Battle of Sekigahara, Tokugawa Iyasu held the traditional head-viewing ceremony. He asked one of his retainers to bring his helmet forward as the first of the heads arrived. He placed the helmet on his head and tied the cord securely under his chin, uttering the words, after a battle, tie the cords of your helmet. A phrase which has become a Japanese proverb, indicating that you can't be sure of victory until everything is complete. Ieyasu had to move quickly to consolidate his position if he was to secure the title of shogun. He announced that the lands across Japan would be redistributed. To his friends, Ieyasu rewarded.
imported moorlands, usually strategically located. His enemies had to settle for pieces of property far removed from Ieyasu's home territory. Ieyasu was on the verge of completing the job of unification begun in earnest by his two predecessors. He quickly schemed to make sure that the emperor could not amass enough power and become a future threat. He made a big show of deference to the emperor, but kept him busy with ceremonial duties and cultural events. The emperor was a virtual prisoner in his own palace. Ieyasu now focused his attentions on the daimyo, the warlords across the land. He announced a new policy called alternate attendance, which forced all warlords to keep two homes, one in their own territory and one in the capital. They had to maintain members of their family in the capital residence as virtual hostages. This proved an effective antidote to any thoughts of rebellion. Keeping a second home was expensive. They were too short on money to finance a potential rebellion. On top of all this, they also had to pay rent to the shogun for the privilege of keeping homes in his capital. Japan, a land of constant war, stood ready to enter a new golden age of peace and cultural renaissance. But one crucial battle was left to fight. Hideyori, the previous shogun's son, remained alive. He posed a threat as the only living contender for the title of shogun. Hideyori would have to die before Ieyasu could truly rule. In 1614, Toyotomi Hideyori shut himself up in his late father's castle of Osaka. One of the strongest castles in Japan was filled with all the people who had suffered at the hands of the Tokugawa triumph. Ronin, the men were called, samurai who had lost their master. Numbers of disaffected Christian samurai who had suffered persecution and anyone else who opposed the Tokugawa's rise to power. Eventually, of course, matters have to come to a head, and Ieyasu realized that. And so in 1614, he used a fairly flimsy excuse to pick a fight with uh, Hideyori, and the result was the, the, uh, the two campaigns at, at Hideyori's castle, Osaka uh, Castle. Hideyori's fortress walls were protected by guns, cannon, and other firearms. His forces were considerable. He would not yield easily. Ieyasu's army numbered almost a quarter of a million men and were equipped with 300 guns aimed at the fortress walls. His greatest weapon, however, was his own cunning mind. First, he sent a representative to engage in phony peace talks with Hideyori's anxious mother. She was seduced by the offer of a quick and bloodless reconciliation and pressed her son to negotiate. He agreed to Ieyasu's terms. The peace negotiations reached a satisfactory conclusion, satisfactory to the Tokugawa, which was that Hideyori would continue to live in Osaka but pose no threat to the Tokugawa. Ieyasu made a show of disbanding his army. Immediately after signing the peace treaty, Ieyasu's engineers began filling in the moat of Osaka Castle. Toyotomi Hideyori, naturally enough, protested at this, but it was pointed out to him that now that peace had come to Japan, who needed moats or walls? But once again, betrayal was in the wind. In May of 1615, Ieyasu returned with a large army. Broken promises aside, the opposing armies now fought in earnest. Hideyori's men put up stiff resistance, but despite their best efforts, the defenders were doomed. In the final hours of the month-long battle, the 73-year-old shogun led his troops through the ramparts of Osaka Castle, now engulfed in flames. Hideyori knew his cause was doomed. In true samurai fashion, he retreated with his mother to a quiet corner far from the combat and committed seppuku. This battle would be remembered as the last conflict ever fought between opposing samurai armies.
The very interesting thing about uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu is that his very success in bringing peace to Japan and stability to Japan and to restoring a sense of unification uh, was to transform radically the nature of the samurai class out of which he came. That is to say, so successful was his government that for almost 250 years, Japan lived one of the most peaceful uh, periods in world history. Uh, there just were not major outbreaks of violence. Ieyasu knew that power could only be sustained when the country was at peace. To maintain the peace, he created a massive bureaucracy, which turned samurai warriors into government workers. And peace would be maintained by sealing Japan's borders. Ieyasu expelled the Christian missionaries and kept Japan a closed fortress until Commodore Perry, with his armed ships, appeared in Tokyo Harbor in 1853. With ferocity, cleverness, and cunning, Togugawa Ieyasu enabled his descendants to rule for almost 250 years. Japan was conceived in war, and for many long centuries lay shrouded in the smoke of death and devastation. And so it was that a warrior would return the nation to peace. And that warrior was the absolute dictator they called Shogun.